Well, good evening. If you would, uh, get you a hymnal and stand with me. Let's start the service with number two. Somebody loves me. seated. Tonight we want to welcome, and uh, you can be making your way up, Miss Teresa Maxwell. And so I'm just so excited to hear this testimony and what the Lord has laid on Miss Teresa's heart. And it's just a pleasure to hear. And I'd like to pray with you real quick. I'll just pray and let you get to it. Dear Lord, we just ask that you bless Miss Teresa. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to hear what you've done through her. It's in Jesus' name I pray. I'm going to put this down so I don't, hopefully I won't echo. You guys can hear me okay? All right, good. Again, I'm Teresa Maxwell, but um, I always consider myself is, I'm just a nobody from nowhere. A little bitty town called Smithville, Tennessee, and didn't ever travel a whole lot until, I'm hearing an echo, you guys. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Until I got married. So, but I consider myself as just somebody that run the race. You know, the big marathons, they'll have, you know, the, the Nigerians or whoever it might be, you know, from Africa. They win, you know, the big, big races. And then they'll say, 5,000 also run. That's me. I just want to be the one that's in the race. So that's what my whole theme is, is run the race. And there's a little verse um, in Psalms, um, because I'll go to something different, about no matter where you are, God's there. And from Psalms 139, 
verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, look, you are there too. If I take the wings of the dawn and settle on the other side of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold on me. If I say, surely darkness covers me, night keeps light at a distance from me. Even darkness is not dark for you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are light. Because wherever God is, there's light. He can fill any dark area of your heart with light. If you let him. Again, I'm just from a little town here, Smithville, and my parents and grandparents were from here and from DeKalb County. My um, mother's parents, her dad was born in 1897 and her mother in 1900, and they got married when my grandmother was 13 and my grandfather was 15. And they had nine kids back then. You had big families. And how they did it and how she had some of them by herself, I cannot imagine. And I come along with my grandparents after they had divorced. So my aunts and uncles and my mom knew a dad different from the man that I knew. My mom um, and my dad, they got married early too. My mom uh, was 15, and she told a story and ran off with my daddy when, and when he turned 18, and they, they went to Ringo, Georgia, and got married. And they had a boy, my brother Michael. And for the first five years, because he was a sickly child and had asthma, he ruled the roost. And then I came along and messed his whole life up. So, um, but I was a sickly child too. And so here my parents were, both of them working a really lot. And I was raised mostly by my little four foot ten grandmother that I was telling you about. Now my dad's father, I never knew because he, he died within a week of my birth. But his mom, probably until I was five, I didn't know how we were related because we called her Mammy, and I didn't know what Mammy was. All I knew is she was Mammy, and she could cook really good. So, uh, and we went to also on uh, many Sundays to my great grandmother and grandfather's house uh, that was uh, out in Crossroads, the Hale family, and we always had lots of food there too. And no matter if five showed up or 50 showed up, Mammy Hale always had enough for everybody to eat. And there was always lots of love. There was never lots of money at anybody's house. And I grew up when you could buy groceries on the credit. Because in the wintertime, my dad, you know, he worked by um, driving bulldozers and things like that. Most of the, Rose to the Lake, my dad actually made. But he worked on a bulldozer for the county most of his life. And so in the wintertime, there wouldn't be any work. But Robert Dale would let you buy groceries on the credit. And then in the spring, when you got back working, you paid him off. So, and a lot of you guys will never understand this either, but when I lived in a house that's it's no longer there now, but right next to where Kilgore sits, uh, we lived there, and the bathroom was outside. And you may have never, some of you guys that may be just a little bit older than me might remember that, but that was different. I remember one of the worst whippings I ever got in my life. It's because I, I got a brand new pair of little pink fuzzy 
slippers for Christmas one time, and I wore them outside in the snow, and I learned them real quick. So, uh, but things like that, again, we were poor, but I didn't know it because other kids, did, you know, were just about the same. And the first memory in my life was me in a hospital, and I can remember that big black mask at two years old coming over my face to have surgery. That's one of the first memories I had. Because I had to have a a surgery on my bladder and uh, because I wasn't formed right. And it it passes in the genes. And so the men pass it to the girl babies. And so my brother passed it to his daughter, if you know, know her. But again, there my parents were with these two sick kids all the time. And we were going to... Hay Street in Nashville on a regular basis. That was a lot of money there to, for the doctors, too, again, that we didn't have. But somehow or another, at my little grandmother's house, my parents, she, at, for a little while when I was small, we lived right next door to each other on Bailiff Street. And that's where we lived when I, I had surgery. And um, I can remember... Th- the day I come home from the hospital, I was going to my granny's house. And so um, I had what's called a, is a super pubic uh, catheter. And so it comes out of your belly and uh, was attached to my leg. And the very first thing, I went running for my mama and went to my granny's house. And a dog got after me. It wasn't even our dog. But I can remember screaming all the way to my granny's house. And I was small enough, I fit in between the door and the screen door. That's how little I was. And then my granny heard me screaming and she let me in. So my grandmother was the one I learned most about God from because I always said heaven and hell lived in that house. Um, Because my grandfather, like many men at that time and from the time uh, he was married till I was small, um, he made me shine. That's how they got money. Because there wasn't a lot of places to work around here. So he made moonshine, shine, and evidently he was pretty good at it because everybody uh, wanted him to work for him in makeup. And um, my grandmother read the Bible all the time. And how she made money was to stand in an ironing board and iron people's clothes. And occasionally she'd keep a, a one or two kids, and I would sit in a rocking chair while she was ironing, and she'd tell stories about raising kids and being out on Rocky River or being, you know, way back in the woods in a holler somewhere, uh, raising kids, and my grandpa was gone somewhere making liquor. But then he'd come back and have a little money from where he'd sold it from, and so they'd feed him, or she would uh, pick berries on the road or things like that. So I learned from my grandmother that I was loved and that for some reason, God loved me. Didn't understand why, because again, I was a little nobody from nowhere. But that he did love me. And she would show me in the Bible, and she had another commentary that I know it is now, but at that time, um, I always called it the heaven and hell book that she would show us. It was a big commentary that was about that thick. And it had pictures in it where her Bible only had very few pictures in it. It had more pictures in it. So I I really liked that book. But I knew, again, that God loved me, even though I was a little kid with nothing from nowhere. So even if we went to school and people dressed better than I did, I really didn't notice it. I guess I was just too stupid to notice because I was just, I had fun and I knew I was loved. My my grandmother would, you know, would make popcorn and stuff on on an old coal stove for us. And I can remember getting a bath in a wash tub behind the wood stove. I can remember uh, her making biscuits, you know, in, in a wood stove and taking the lid off and setting a big pot in it and putting beans in it. Um, things like that that maybe other people didn't know about. 
But I just thought it was everyday life. That's the way I live. But as I grew, I started finding everybody didn't live that way. But I had lots of friends. And again, my parents knew that God was important. And there's a, now there's a Catholic church there, but it was, uh, there's a church on um, West Main Street. And at that time it was called West Side Mission because First Baptist Church had started a little church. And it was wood benches, and I can remember about, about where you guys are sitting. And that's where my mama and my daddy and my brother and I sat. And I always sat right under my daddy's wing is what I called it. And if you wiggled too, and squiggled a little bit too much, I don't know if you know what milk, milk in the mouse is, but he would mash your finger and he would give it a look. But if he was good when you got outside, he would tear a piece of juicy fruit, gum in half, and he'd give me one and he'd give Michael, the other half, and that was if we was good on Sundays. And my daddy, his name was Charles, but nobody knew that. Everybody knew my daddy was Toots. And, and his, his daddy nicknamed him that. But uh, we, he had a great aunt that lived in Chattanooga. And so sometimes after, right after church, we'd head out to Chattanooga. And my mom would have chicken and biscuit in this little tray with aluminum foil over it, and about halfway there, we'd stop and we'd eat chicken and biscuit. And then we'd get there and we'd visit with my great aunt, Lena. And sometimes we'd go over um, to, you know, the river or to uh, the battlefield, you know, there around Chattanooga. And, you know, I loved all of the places that we got to see when we got to visit Aunt Lena. But my daddy, when it came dark, wanted to be in his bed. So we didn't travel a whole lot. Um, a few times we went to my Aunt Marie's house in Indiana, Jasper, Indiana, uh, my mom's sister. Um, but uh, one time we stayed, I think one night, and we were supposed to stay all week, and we come home. Um, but uh, we'd make those short trips anywhere you could drive and get back by night. Daddy was okay with that, but he just didn't like to travel. He wanted to be in his own bed. So I loved learning about the world. I loved history. I loved when missionaries would come to our church. I can remember a missionary from Africa had, it was called a rain stick. It was a long stick about this long, but when he would turn it and move it, it sounded like rain falling. And I thought that was neat. And, you know, they would tell their stories. And, I, oh, I just love that. I love that. And because mom and dad worked all the time, uh, my mama worked at the hospital. And, uh, again, dad was out, out working for the county. Um, people like Margie and Donald Smith, um, they would take me and Marlene and us, different ones, to church camp in the summer. You know, my parents would scrounge up the money for me to go, um, to be there a whole week. And again, I got to spend time with missionaries that whole week. So I loved that. I always thought, God can use you in all different places. And I thought, could God ever use a little nobody from nowhere? He sure can. He sure can. And... Um, I brought this just to let you know. Together we are Bible strong. If you read God's word, he will ease your fears because 365 days in a year and 365 times in the Bible, he'll say don't worry or don't fear because he knows we're going to, but he wants to calm us. And he wants to, the whole world to know he's the God of everybody. He's God of that little girl from here in Smithville, Tennessee. But also, 
recently we have a, a girl named Destra from Indon Indonesia that we're kind of sponsoring. And God loves her too, and she needed to know that. And God loves everybody here. He loves my boys that are here with me, and all of you too. And he wants us to share that with people. If you've been saved and done the ABCs, which is so easy, then we've got to take more people to heaven with us. You can't be the only one to go. It'd be very lonesome. I met uh, Brother uh, Terry Fessler and Miss Linda uh, at a little church here in town. I went there for many, many years. Actually, my cousin uh, Arthur Allen uh, uh, Redman preached there before he did. And that's when I started uh, going around Indian Creek. And then uh, Brother uh, Fessler uh, preached there. And Tootsie Birchfield and I had worked together at the hospital for years and years and years. And Tootsie had always wanted to be a missionary. And I always said, Tootsie, I do too. And she kept saying, I guess he don't want me to go nowhere because ain't nobody asked me. I said, I'm just like you. Ain't nobody asked me either. But there happened to be a... Right there, good. A partnership with Tennessee and Rio Brazil come together. And Ray and Sharon Fairchild, oh, I just love them. Um, they invited people from Tennessee to come help tell the people in Brazil that God loved them. Not Jesus, the cold statue that's I have here. It's the Jesus in here. You got to know he lives in you. It's not just somebody that you pull out of your pocket for emergencies. He's the everyday Jesus. And so we wanted to go to Brazil to share people that he's still alive. Jesus sent us a comforter to live inside while he goes and intercedes for us in, in heaven. And they even gave us a little card that tells the plan of salvation. And, it's the, um, and we had a little bracelet, and I don't have the bracelet any longer, but uh, the black bead reminds us of sin. A red bead reminds us of Jesus' love. A white bead reminded us that he washed us white as snow. A green bead reminds us that we have new life. He makes us new. And then a yellow bead reminds us of heaven. That that's where we're going home to. So I, I kept that little card. And again, uh, Brother Scott, as soon as he saw that shirt, it reminded him of, again, we've partnered with, with Rio for ten, over 10 years, actually. It was first fall for just uh, 10 years, but we love going. I love the people of Brazil. And I went five different times. And I've got some things here. I've got, again, I love the Cross the Redeemer statue. And again, you ride a tram um, up uh, the hill to where it is. And I've got things like, um, again, you got to have soccer. You know, all the kids there play soccer all the time. And... Uh, the first time I went, we went to the Hard Rock Cafe. They took us there, and we did the YMCA song in there. Y'all have seen all of us Baptists up trying to do that. It was so funny. It was so funny. But again, part of my heart is still in Brazil, just like I know you guys are too, um, because I have brothers and sisters there. Because I witnessed to them, and multiple people you know, here have been and witnessed to them. I can remember especially, and I don't know his name, but he still lives in my heart. There was, at one of the churches we were at, you know, the way we would, they would break us up in little groups and 
we'd go out to different houses and, and things like that, and we'd walk. Some, some people would get to go to schools and all different kinds of places we'd go. But when we would come back to the church, they would always have food there for us to eat. And, um, there was a little man that was just raking, mostly gravels around and trying to keep the yard clean in the church. And I noticed every day he was there, but not, nobody was talking to him. And so I, one day when he would come back, I said, how are you doing today? You've been so busy. You've got this all, you know, yard all neat. He said, well, through the interpreter, again, we always had to have interpreters. But through the interpreter, he said he came from another state there to where we were at because he needed to work and have money and he didn't have any, a job or anything. But the church was letting him work there to feed him, really. And I said, well, guess what? God sent a little nobody from Tennessee just to come see you because God loves you so much. His one and only son died for you. I said, has anybody been talking to you about it? You work here at the church. Not anybody had told him the plan of salvation, even though he was working there at the church. And I said, well, God put you here from another state and me here from another country so that we both could be brothers and sisters in Christ. And I said, I'm just going to be here for a little while, but we'll be family forever in heaven. That's what taking God's word to other people is. Because he loves you no matter where you're from. Because he died for everybody. Not just people in the USA, not just people from Brazil, but people everywhere. And I've, again, I was at that time at Indian Creek. But Tootsie and Rosie, uh, when the church at Indian Creek was having some problems, and uh, I started coming here. <coughs> and sitting with Toots and Rosie on different times. And because I got coming regular, Brother Bill came to work and asked could he talk to me. I thought, what have I done? Did I sit in somebody's place? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, I just want to know what's your plans. I said, what do you mean what's my plan? He said, well, you've been coming pretty regular. What, it, what are you going to do? And I said, I said, well, I think God is putting me at this church because he's got a work for me to do. I said, where I'm from, um, I, I gave him the revelation reference of Laodicea. I said, I think I'm there and I need to get out of there. And, and if it's all right with you, Miss Tootsie has invited me that I could keep coming here. He said, yes, I just wanted to make sure that's what you wanted to do. So I moved my membership over, over here. You know, he just wanted to know, am I just hanging out for a little while to see what y'all was doing or what? But yes, I moved my membership to here. But um, again, I want to tell you just a little bit of how I was saved. You know, I, again, I was raised in a godly home. I was raised going to church. And... Let me tell you about Vacation Bible School. If you haven't noticed, following Jesus changes the game. It happens to be one of our t-shirts for this year for Vacation Bible School. But that's where I got saved at. I was still at that little mission church, and after, after I'd been there a while, we had enough members um, and it may, they may still have the picture because I can remember standing in front of my daddy that when it was named Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, Brother Kenneth Trammell and Miss Peggy, um, I love Miss Peggy. I was on her heels all the time. I'm sure she got tired of wagging me everywhere because, again, my mom and daddy worked all the time. And on Wednesday night, again, we had... GAs and the ACT teens. And again, we were talking about those missionary people that I love. And so um, when it comes to um, 
being saved, Miss Peggy wanted to make sure that I understood how. And so, um, if you guys didn't know, when we were small, we went to Vacation Bible School at multiple churches, including this one. And uh, I can remember Miss Margie, Miss Brownie, and, and them had wonderful cookies and Kool-Aid. Can't remember the stories, but I remember the cookies. And at, um, at Calvary, on um, each night, we, just like we did, Monday through Friday, uh, we had stories, uh, you know, of how people serve God. And the whole time, we're also talking about those ABCs, uh, admit, believe, and confess. And when it comes to Friday, Mr. Nixon was cooking hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill, and we were getting ready to leave to go eat those. And I said, Miss Peggy, can I talk to you? And she said, oh, yeah, come on in here. And so we went to another classroom, and she led me again through those ABCs. And I was saved that Friday night, and I still got a hamburger and a hot dog, too. I didn't miss out on that. And I can remember being baptized at First Baptist Church because, again, we was a little bitty church, and we didn't have a baptistry. So uh, since they had sponsored that church, they let us use their, their baptistry. And I think I was in between eight or nine when I was saved. And again, by the next year, I was already going to church camp. And again, Margie and would always make sure that we got there and picked us up. But Marlene and, um, was in Actines, and I was in Actines too at my church. But uh, when they had the gold crowning, uh, I can remember coming here to receive that gold crown uh, on that. So, again, no matter which church I was at, seems like I always ended up here. So, isn't it wonderful how God just weaves a tapestry together for you? And I do have a, a small tapestry here that I wanted to share with you. When I look at this from Egypt, again, Egypt is part of the Holy Land. If no one's ever told you, when Christ was a small child, he had to leave Israel to keep from being killed. And he grew up as a small child over in Egypt. So when I look at this, who, guess who I really see? I see Joseph is who I really see. Because who was next to Pharaoh? when he had to leave and go. But this is of Tut. And again, I've been to the backfields of Egypt. So if you ever said to anybody that you're from BFE, I am from, not from BFE, but I've been to backfields of Egypt. And they're still over there with, they have carts and horses and stuff. So what, even then I thought, hey, we're not as bad as they are. Because I could remember sheep and goats. And, and again, they have schools to teach people on those looms how to weave things. Because that's still a great export is from there. So again, Israel and Jordan and Egypt are all still parts of the Holy Land. And I did get to go to the Holy Land. And Petra, uh, I do have a picture up here that I rode a camel at Petra. And again, no matter where you're at, God can use you if you're willing to serve. Because it was like a year-long preparing before I went to the Holy Land and um, was there uh, actually with Brenda and Doug Hooper and uh, Rita and Dr. Cripps, a whole bunch of us anyway. It was, it was like 35 from around this area. But um, in the preparing, I bought from Miss Patricia a little Star of David. And I said, I'm doing that it's to prepare my heart. And I would reach up and I would do that. 
And I think, they're special people. They're God's special people. And I didn't want to forget that. And that one little piece of jewelry that I wore even when I was there, and my husband said, I can't believe you're going to wear that. That's just going to be a target. And I said, if it's a target, I want it to go right through the center right there. The bullet. I said, I don't care. Because if God's leading you somewhere, he's going to either bring you back home or take you home. And it doesn't matter which one. Because it's all still good. And so, you know, you have borders you have to go through over, from countries and countries, whether it, whether it be in Europe or, or even over in the Holy Land. And I happened to be coming from Jordan into Israel, and there was a crossing guard there, which are military people. Uh, he said, why do you wear that? Because he knew that this group of people was Christian, Christian people from the United States. He said, why do you have that on? He said, you're not Jewish, are you? And I said, no, but my Savior is. Can I tell you about him? And something as small as that can let you tell people who Jesus is. It doesn't matter where you're at or where you're from. I have a little bracelet on here to remind me of Cuba. Lots of people haven't been to Cuba because we've, we've been, had trouble with them for years and years but uh, because of Fidel. But Terry and I actually got to go to Cuba. And while we were there, we went to a cemetery and to a church that, that was there beside it. And we were all walking through there. And it's so, it's so beautiful. It, it really is another country that no matter where God sends me, I love it. Because they're all just like us. They really are. They may speak a different language, but it ends up being in the same. So... At this church, I went in, I always have to go in and, and see what's going on at, at the churches at different countries and have what they look like and how they're, they're serving God. And so I happened to walk in and I was looking at through the all different kinds of things there. And I heard kind of a commotion behind me and I, um, I was still looking at, at all the things. And this little person said, I come to see the priest because I have a sore on my leg and the priest is not here. What am I going to do? Because there's no priest here. And that just broke my heart. Why would anybody think that they had to go see the priest? That they couldn't talk to God directly. And it just broke my heart. And so I had to stop right there and pray for that person about their leg, that it would be healed, but that most of all, that they would know the great physician, that they didn't have to go through a priest, that they could speak to him personally and have a personal relationship with him. That's, it just, no matter where you're at, don't leave him at home. If you're going to school, if you're going to work, Take him with you. you know, and even for your children, when I have them in little church, I'll say, you have to open your Bible. Otherwise, it's... Mm-hmm. He can't talk to you if you don't open his word. So I have a, a little bit more here to read to you. I have... In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to everyone who has longed for his 
appearing. Are we longing for his appearing? Miss Catherine and I was talking about this morning that we were longing for him to come back and take us home. But in the meantime, we got to tell people about who he is and take more with us. For those experiencing tragedies, we have to be God's hands. For those that are hurting, God will give comfort. But we have to tell them that he weep. For those that are ill, we will be God's healing help. For those dealing with death of a loved one, we'll be God's hope for them. For those searching for answers, we will point them to the way. For the lost and dying world, we will be God's ambassadors of his great salvation. And the way we do that is by being Bible strong. And again, I've got, we talked about Brazil, we've talked about the Middle East, but I also have um, been to Europe and I've got some things here from Europe that I brought from, from Paris and from, the, you know, um, all over the world, God may send you. But again, I'm just a little nobody from nowhere. And if he can use somebody like me, he can use you too. You just have to be willing to go. And I was in a concentration camp in Europe. And it said, work will set you free. Well, for those Jewish people, work didn't set them free. They ended up in gas chambers, in ovens, and was stacked high and burned because people didn't have any value at that time. But have we done anything any different? We've sent little babies to garbage cans and to the dump and we burned them and we put them in little dishes and sent them away to a lab. We may have sent the person that could cure cancer to death. Who knows? Because each little person that God makes, he makes them for a purpose. And I've shared with you guys, sometimes some of God's greatest gifts come in real ugly packages. So, but he has numbered each one of our days. And he has encouraged us to go the narrow path and not the wide one. But he gives us our own human will to make a choice. And even if we make the choice and we go the long way around, he'll bring you back over here. Because he's not going to let a child of his ever leave his hand. It's your guarantee of heaven. Even though you might move over here and say, well, today I'm going to do this and that and the other thing. And I'm not opening my Bible today. I'm too busy. He might just remind you with a sickness. He might just remind you that... Your children need him too. He might just remind you there's people in this world that's right in front of you that are hungry. Not only hungry for food, but hungry to know him. My poor old Terry Maxwell, my husband, he has... Smile through all my travels because he hates to fly. But I have gotten him on a plane a time or two. But uh, he'll, he'll just say, you just go ahead. I'll be here when you get back and you can tell me all about it. And when we're traveling somewhere in, here in the United States, I've been 
eating at places, and I'll say, uh, whatever's left over, just put it in a box. And more than once, I'll say, I think there'll be somebody that'll need a little something to go with us. Better to get a, a drink for them, too. There'll be somebody before we get back on the interstate we need to give this to. There always is. And sometimes just run into Kufel to Sam's. We'll, uh, he's willing to say, okay, we got to go over to Wendy's and get a burger and some coffee because there's somebody right down the street here that needs a little food. Or when you make a little package up in Sunday school, that very day, somebody's sitting at the library and they don't have any food. And you might have to go give them your little bag right on day one. Again, because God can use you if you're willing. If you're willing. In Isaiah chapter 6. And let me see where I start. There was someone that was like me that didn't have clean lips and wanted to yak and talk all the time, and that was me all the time. I could get in trouble at school real easy from talking. But um, in the Bible, there's stories about people that get in trouble from talking, talking. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sins atoned for. Then I heard a voice of Adonai, or God, saying, Whom should I send and who will go for us? And so I said, here am I, send me. Can he send you too? And he will train you, because I sure didn't know what to do, but he will train you. You don't have to be the winner of the race. You don't have to be a great anything, because I'm sure not. But he can take somebody from nowhere and use them to tell people of who he is. This is my little travel Bible. And so, because uh, I was always afraid. The people that have uh, been in my classes before, you know, I've always got lots of things stuck in my Bible, little memory things. And so, this is the Bible I'll take with me. And, and even this, at the border of Jordan, when I was getting ready to get on a plane, and I had a backpack, and this is always next to me. And you know, it's always my luck that, because I'm always talking. And so they pulled me aside, and it happened to be a lady who opened my bag, going through the check-in, said, Jordan, what's this? I said, it's the Bible. She didn't know what that was. So she asked me again, what is this? I said, it's, I, you know, again, I'm in ignorance, so I thought if I said it slower, she would understand. <laughs> it's the Bible. <laughs> she didn't know what that was. And so she asked me the third time, and I said, it's God's holy word. True from cover to cover. And then she kind of opened her mouth and went, that it could be in a little book that small. She stuck it back in my backpack and handed it to me. Go, go. So, again, that was just a seed. But God could take that little seed. And who knows about that woman now? Because it was obvious she was from a different faith and had to wear special clothing to cover her head. But Jesus died for her too. So no matter where you're at, take him with you. 
share him with others, and let people know he's worth dying for. He's worth everything because, again, Jesus died for each one of us. And if you're a little uncomfortable here, that's okay. Because your reward is in heaven. Because he went to prepare a place. And if he went to prepare a place, he's coming back again. And I know where he's coming to. Megiddo. And I've been there. And the next time I go back, I think I'll be there with him. So I'll, I'll... I've got lots of things here for you to look at and see, whether it be from Israel or Jordan or from a little bitty reservation in Montana. And when we were in Montana, some of them went to the reservation to work and and some of us, again, went door to door. And Eddie still reminds me of that little door-to-door that we did. But again, he'll use you if you're willing. So you're welcome to look at all these things. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them for you. But again, run the race. That's all. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then you can come up and ask questions and see these things. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to hear this testimony of what you've done through just one of yours that uh, says she was just no one from nowhere, but Lord, you know that she is someone from somewhere, and Lord, you love us all as you love her, and oh God, we just ask that you bless us, help us to take this message that Ms. Teresa has given, Lord. That, he use it, that you use those seeds, God. Lord, take it and put it in our hearts and let it be a seed in our heart, Lord, that would grow to more and further service for you, a deeper commitment to share the gospel. God, I ask that you do this, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Now come on up. I want to see this.